participant of this first section to the table, Professor Luis Benidovich, Professor Claudio Beato, and Professor Ricardo Pajola. the opportunity to welcome the participants of this symposium on society and nature and thank you for accepting our invitation to engage in this dialogue between social and natural scientists. We know that the demand for our particular research agenda would increase in demands for inter- and transdisciplinary efforts. But we also know that the different protocols of social and non-social science do not make it easy to cross some disciplinary borders. Furthermore, we also know that there are reciprocal prejudices to be overcome. Yet, we firmly recognize that science, be it social or natural, experimental or not, is justified by its social function. We all share the social relevance value. With regards to the particular concern of this symposium, the dilemmas posed to us by, sustain by the sustainability desiderata, we are embracing a new worldview as challenging as it was about two centuries ago, the new worldview at the time that gave origin to the notion of societal development as something not only desirable, but viable and permanent. I mean, the notion taken for granted in the pre-modern world that humans were irrevocably subordinated to the caprices of gods or nature came gradually to be completely replaced by the notion that persistent growth was normality while economic stagnation was a disease to be combated. Today, we are witness to a new worldview that makes us aware that unless we enforce self-sustained growth, we will not be able to carry on the development project. In, if in the pre-modern world humans thought of nature as something they had to protect themselves from, modernity brought the idea that nature is to be conquered thanks to the purposeful use of reason and technological invention. <coughs> Presently, in this era some called second modernity, or others prefer to call late modernity, we came to realize that nature is to be nurtured so that development can go on. That simply conquering nature, as earlier modernizers advocated, will, will kill the chicken of the golden eggs. We also are aware that while it's true that the sustainability challenge is something that is relevant for the whole humanity, there are different patterns and different rhythms for the distribution of the risks and costs across societies. That is to say, some social segments or groups are significantly more vulnerable than others. Of course, in the end, society share many positive or negative externality generated by the way nature is dealt with. But if in the long run we will all be dead, it's also very true that now and then real people may suffer much more or much less depending on the aggregate results, co the human contributions dedicated to reduce hunger, physical pain, poverty, <coughs> ignorance, and many other forms of discomfort and suffering. Scientists across the world face the ethic demand to contribute to improve the material and ideal means to reduce human suffering. The task is immense, the battles face new. It is in this spirit that we establish our scientific agenda and confer a place in it to the effort to establish conversations across our disciplinary borders. With this optimist message in the name of the Brazilian Academy of Science and of the International Social Science Council, my two hats here, I conclude these introductory notes expressing once again our gratitude to the participants and to the public to each who contributes so much to this meeting 
and without further ado, I pass the award to the session presenters. Each one of them will have 20 minutes, five minutes to be able to tell you. Now the floor is yours. We start with the order of the floor. So, uh, uh, this image that you're seeing there uh, was actually uh, the image that was seen by Yuri Gagarin in April 12, 1961. And that was the first time uh, a human being saw the Earth from outside, which is a symbolic step towards uh, having a planetary conscience about the, the, the planet we live. Now, it's interesting because if we imagine uh, a being from outside space approaching Earth from the dark side, then uh, he or she or it will see a, a, a very interesting uh, scenery. Uh, if uh, this being looks closely at the Earth at the night, then he'll remark that you know, the light is distributed in a funny way. Uh, it, it looks like the population of the Earth is concentrated uh, here in the United States, in Europe, also in this small region here, which is Saudi Arabia. But of course, you all know that uh, here in the uh, North, in North America, you have about 300 million inhabitants, while in Africa, there's more than 1 billion inhabitants. So uh, the conclusion of this being from out, from out, out, out space, uh, will not be right. Uh, the distribution is not of population is not concentrated in these areas. It's interesting that many other maps have the same kind of distribution. For instance, if you look at the energy consumption on Earth, you see again this kind of distribution. Red stands for over 10,000 uh, uh, kilograms of oil equivalent uh, per capita per year. Uh, you see again the same concentration here, here, here. <coughs> if you look at water consumption, again, you have the same kind of concentration. Yellow is for less than 220 liters per person per day. Uh, deep blue is in this region here, up to 14,000 liters per person per day. If you look at food security, again, the same kind of distribution. You see, uh, uh, here, green stands for low risk of food security. Again, the same kind of distribution. Uh, red means extreme risk. And these numbers here kind of order the countries by the food security risk. Uh, if you look at the percentage of people living on less than $2 a day, again, you have the same kind of distribution, <coughs> about the same. You see that uh, in these blue regions, you have under 2% of the people living on less than $2 a day. Uh, in the black region, you have over 80% of people living with less than $2 a day. Last map, if you look at the tons of CO2 emission per capita per year, again, the same kind of distribution. Here are the countries that, uh, that uh, emit uh, about 30 uh, tons of CO2 uh, per capita per year. And, uh, and uh, then in white, you have uh, the countries that emit much less. So this collection of maps uh, points out to uh, strong, big challenges for science and also for gov governance. And we could list some of the challenges like this. Food security, uh, water supply, energy supply, aging diseases, sanitation, climate change and air pollution, natural disasters, science education, quality education for all, sustainable use of biodiversity, management of huge urban agglomerations, sanitation, transportation, education, energy, food, and water supply, everything that comes together with this uh, urban uh, policy and urban science, uh, and also the question of ethics, which has to do responsibility towards social inclusion and the reduction of inequality. So it's a, it's a big list which uh, points out to the challenges that ne necessarily involve a connection between natural sciences and social sciences. 
I always find these divisions very strange, you know, like if social was not, social science were not literal, and literal science were not social. Uh, there are other possible divisions. People sometimes call about exact science so that the others will be inexact, uh, or maybe human science, and then my part will be inhuman, <laughs> right? Exact science. Anyway, uh, so anyway, uh, they are all uh, uh, science. They, they represent knowledge about the world, about the human being, and they are needed here uh, in this uh, in this situation. There are also big challenges for for government, uh, for global go governance, and these are just two examples. There are projects for climate engineering, which are very uh, uh, audacious. Uh, 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 projects, and that clearly require uh, a global governance, because uh, they, they are clever projects, but they, cause, they can also cause severe harm to the planet. Uh, there, are, there is a problem of governance of the high seas, and, and that's, you know, that belongs to humanity, and that's also a, 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 an open problem, which is a very tricky one. So, you see that uh, uh, just in this few slides, you have everything together. You have science, uh, you have natural sciences, you have social sciences, and you have governance as well. In fact, the scientific community has done, I think, pretty well with respect to uh, uh, governance or trying to uh, reach uh, the uh, powers of the Earth. Uh, and and this is, these are just some examples of this uh, uh, work by the, by the scientific society, you have these several associations that produce uh, interesting uh, uh, studies about uh, energy, about uh, food security and so forth. You even have some organizations like this one, Israeli Palestinian Science Organization, that uh, does some very interesting work putting together scientists from Israel and Palestine. <coughs> so this is science for peace, really, but in action. So, you know, you have all these efforts. However, there is a, a big problem with translation. And, uh, and, uh, and this problem can be characterized by this uh, slide here. Uh, we are still missing a key translator from rhetoric into action. Okay. Now, so how can we go around it? How can we reach the governments? How can we reach the, the politicians? Uh, and, 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 and try to have them really act on these kind of problems. Well, there are several things that one can do. And I would like to give you an example from Brazil. It's, a, it's an example from which has a, a limited reach. And as, as the years go by, we see that the consequences of that were smaller than we would like. Anyway, in 2010, we had this fourth national conference of science, technology, and innovation. And I'm talking about it because I was the secretary general of that conference. Uh, that, uh, in, in a period of three days in Brasilia, we had 4,000 participants, more than 40,000 internet accesses. And in this conference, uh, everything connected with science was discussed. Uh, it was preceded by regional meetings, dialogue, between academy, government, business, labor unions, social movements, they are all present in this conference. But we had important confederations, for instance, of industry present there. We have labor unions, of course, academy, uh, many people from government, uh, social movements. They are all discussing uh, science and its possible application for the benefit of society. Uh, the blue book from the conference has a collection of very important recommendations. Some of them were followed, many of them were forgotten uh, by the government. So uh, we're still really to have them uh, followed and applied by the government. So this is an example of an action which one might uh, take in order to make the society aware of science and participate also in this very important dialogue. Now, I told you about Brazil, but also like to tell you a little bit about Latin America and the Caribbean. What I'm going to show you is the result of discussions we have had in Latin America and the Caribbean for many years. And, and from those discussions also have many recommendations. So it's clear that we have in this region the largest sink of carbon from the planet. We have a huge, we have huge water basins and a huge biodiversity. 
At the same time, we have a strong social inequality, a high vulnerability to natural disasters, a small number of researchers, a deficient educational system, and exports dominated by commodities. So there is a long way to go, and there are big challenges in this region as well. Now, many proposals have been uh, uh, advanced in, in, in recent years. For instance, the, uh, uh, one of the proposals was to have multi-user labs that would uh, focus on Latin American uh, problems. Uh, a regional open access environment to make it easier to exchange scientific knowledge. Science education is a big problem in the region. I think it's not only in the region. Recent publications by the National Academy of Sciences in the United States have pointed out to this problem. They even have a book that is called uh, Rising Above, Above the Gathering Storm, in which they uh, emphasize that science education should uh, play a special role uh, in, the, in the priorities of the government and in, in, in the community also. Uh, new financing mechanisms for, 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 for collaboration in the region and national laws favoring collaboration in the region with less bureaucracy. So some of the recommendations. Now, uh, if we want to uh, invent the future in this region and even in, in, in worldwide, uh, we need to develop science and technology uh, as a shared uh, regional and global responsibility. We need digital libraries of science and technology with universal access, virtual networks of excellence, linking scientific talents of entire regions and the globe with a multidisciplinary approach. We need education beyond the school, and I think that's something that is strongly felt in many countries. A reformulation of structure and programs of higher education towards more interaction between disciplines. Global funding mechanisms should be strengthened for support of science and technology in developing nations. Global institutional funds supporting centers of excellence and multi-user labs of national or regional character. This is a recommendation which was, you know, we, we were discussing that before Future Earth. And I think Future Earth is a very nice example of that. Uh, a global, uh, so to have a competitive grant system, again, Future Earth is an example. But I would like to, uh, since I mentioned that, to just make a comment about this item here, which is very much close to us. You know, many of us here, are, we are university people, and, and we have a, a, a very special role to play in this part, in this reformulation of structure and problems of higher education. And in fact, in many regions of the globe, and I should say in Latin America in special, programs, university programs, higher education programs are really very much outdated and, and focused on, on, on specific disciplines. Uh, while in other places we have this effort to, uh, to uh, uh, emphasize uh, inter an interdisciplinary approach. So this is an example uh, from Harvard. Lawrence Summers was the president of Harvard from 2001 to 2006. And, uh, and uh, in the uh, program reform that he led in Harvard at that time, he mentioned in the program that uh, it's a very interesting sentence, an educational culture where it is an embarrassment not to know the names of five plays by Shakespeare, but okay not to know the difference between a gene and a chromosome is not functional. So it's, uh, it's really a new view of culture and I think it's a view of culture which we need in our contemporary world. Now, the new curriculum of Harvard uh, is such that students must follow a course in each of the following groups. And that's not just following the, the course, it's really what they call activity-based learning. So you see the eight groups here. It includes aesthetic and interpretive, and interpretive understanding, culture and belief, empirical reasoning, ethical reasoning, <coughs> science of living systems, science of the physical universe, societies of the world, the United States and the world. I, I mentioned that as an example of, of the role that universities can play in order to stimulate and emphasize interdisciplinarity. We should start with the education of our students. Of our students. Now, of course, in, in all these slides, I have mentioned science with this prospect of contributing 
to solve some big challenges that, are, that exist today for humankind. But I would like also to mention another side uh, of science, uh, which is a more prospective side, which is a less utilitarian side of science. And I think we should keep that in mind. I think a good example of that was an example from 1850. You know, Faraday, from classic physicists, made demonstrations of electricity <coughs> for the uh, court of, of, of England. And uh, in one occasion, the Minister of Finance of, of, of England, see, it's always, always we have the Ministers of Finance asking this kind of, of questions. So the Minister of, of Science asked him, you know, what was the practical value of electricity? And Faraday answered like that, <coughs> one day, sir, you make taxes. <laughs> Now, we could, we could look at another example, and you know, I'm a physicist, so I'll give an example also from the area of physics. Uh, in the beginning of the 20th century, you have these bright young people here. They, you know, they had, their ages was between the 20s and uh, 20 years old and 30 years old. Schrodinger was a little bit older at the time, he was, uh, you know, 32, 33 years old. You know, young people who were playing with a new vision of nature quantum physics. And in fact, they did not have any idea of the possible applications of that, of that new view of, of nature. And they are moved really by curiosity, passion, and fascination. They are not moved by, by possible applications of what they were doing. And yet, you know, many years after that, there was this paper published in Scientific America that was in the year 2001, celebrating the 100th anniversary of the beginning of quantum physics, uh, John Wheeler and Max Tegmar wrote this paper, 100 Years of Quantum Mysteries, and there they wrote that an estimated 30% of the United States gross national product was based on inventions made possible by quantum mechanics, from semiconductors in computer chips to lasers in compact disc players magnetic resonance, imaging in hospitals, and much more. So, inventing the future has to do with that. It has to do with science moved by passion, by curiosity. And in fact, uh, if I'm saying that, I'm still, have, I'm still having a kind of utilitarian bias, because I'm telling you that science may be good because in the future there will be applications. Now, not necessarily so. Uh, you have all heard about the Large Hadron Collider, uh, the discovery of the Higgs boson, uh, and frankly, nobody knows if that's going to be used for humanity in a utilitarian sense. However, it's quite clear that it may be useful in, in other senses. By the way, you know, there is this project between Israel, Iran, Jordan, and Turkey <coughs> to, uh, it's a multi-million dollar size project, they want to build an accelerator so as to have a collaboration with these people. So this is one application of this, of this kind of science, science for peace, science for collaboration. But I think we should go ahead of that, because if you look at the cosmos, uh, you are not thinking about possible applications. You are thinking about passion and curiosity. You are thinking about culture. Again, the main moving forces are curiosity, passion, and fascination. And with that, I think we should mention some sentences by famous people uh, in science uh, that show the connection between science and other uh, human individuals. Plunk would say that it's impossible to make a clear cut between science, religion, and art. The whole is never equal simply to the sum of its various parts. I would say that the most beautiful thing we experience is the mysterious. It is the source of all true art and all science. He to whom this emotion is a stranger, who can no longer pause to wander and stand back in awe, is as good as dead. His eyes are closed. In Dirac, a famous physicist, to say, a theory with mathematical beauty is more likely to be correct than an ugly one that fits some experimental data. Okay? So that shows that uh, science is very intimately connected to, to, to art, and to other branches of culture. And it's not by chance that Einstein had a study group on philosophy and physics with two friends, 
and they read, they had discussions on all these people here, look at Juan Carré here, uh, Spinoza, Miguel de Cervantes, Picasso, had La Banque at Picasso, also in France, where they read many, they discussed many interesting books, and actually both Einstein and Picasso had access to La Science and Hypothèse of Juan Carré. Uh, Picasso got this book from a friend, which might explain uh, their, their, their view of, of nature, which has some points in common. So, Juan Carré would say, the scientist does not study nature because it is useful, he studies it because he delights in it, and he delights in it because it is beautiful. And Pablo Picasso would say that a major study should be a laboratory. There one does not make art in the manner, in the manner of a monkey, one invents. Painting is a play of the mind. So both were really doing with plays of the mind when they were doing art and science, and perhaps it's not a coincidence that the Demoiselle d'Avignon and the electrodynamics of moving bodies appear at about the same time, both exploring the subtleties of higher dimensions and trying to understand these higher dimensions in an artistic way or in a scientific way. Uh, to finish, I would like to say that inventing the future means also several things that maybe should be added to the uh, contemporary declaration of human rights. One of them is that every child in the world should have the right to quality education, quality health services, proper water and food, and equal opportunities to develop. More than that, and I use here the words of Brian Greene, who is a physicist with uh, street theory, it is the birthright of every child. It is a necessity for every adult to look out on the world and see that the wonder of the cosmos transcends everything that divides us. And I would like to add my own words on that. Due to a subtle quirk of the evolution of the human species, the passion for science serves humanity, evolutionizes people's daily life, affects social organization, ways, and problems. Thank you very much. These are some numbers, some figures about the crime and violence problem in Brazil. We have a huge and dramatic increase in the last years. Uh, between 80s and the recent years, we have more than a million and 200,000 people that died by murder. And uh, if you discuss the problem in traffic accidents, we have uh, almost one million people that died in traffic accidents. And the dramatic aspect in this is that is a, a question that affects mainly the youth. Youth are the main victims in Brazil, and in other countries in Latin America is not so different. I think that's only magnitude. And uh, youth are dying uh, in Brazil, uh, more than 400,000 uh, are victims of homicides, uh, 200,000 victims on traffic accidents. Well, uh, when you look what's happening in terms of Brazil, we there, there is some interesting characters in the homicides. They are very well concentrated and we have some kind of contagion effect here. Uh, for example, in the last years we, we are watching a, 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 a <coughs> an increase of crime in the northeast region of the country and the, in the past the southeast is the region that concentrated more the, the homicides in the country. You know? It's interesting because this is the region where the federal government put more investment in the last years. We, we change a lot in terms of inequality, we change a lot in terms of economic development, and despite that we have an incredible uh, increase in the crime rates. Uh, this is the concentration now. Now we have a, a kind of concentration that is especially in the northeast region. No? And uh, <coughs> it's important to understand this because crime needs a evidence-based policy to, uh, uh, to, to, to have an, an effective approach to this. 
and I will I would like to discuss some of the the characters of this evidence approach to the crime and violence problem. Uh, first of all, we need to understand the patterns and, and, and the regularities of the events in crime and violence. In general, there is a, a general law in criminology that disobeys a Pareto distribution. You know? There is some few places that concentrate a lot of crime and some few people commit a lot of crime also. We have to understand the distribution. It's, it's, it's obvious, but it's difficult to identify exactly where they are happening. And evaluating the results. No, it's interesting because this is an area where people don't like to evaluate their, where, what is, is they are doing. No? This, for example, is the Pareto distribution of violent crime in Rio de Janeiro. It's interesting. This is the Pareto distribution of violent crime in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, insecurity and fear, as well as crime, are extremely concentrated, especially. Concentration and diversity are the most common elements in this distribution. Crime takes place in a specific location at specific times, following very, very clear pattern. And uh, as you can see in this slide, 50% of the map and occurrence of violent crime in Rio de Janeiro are concentrated in little more than 100 of the almost 8,000 census districts in the city. Or we have uh, some very few places where it happens more the crime. These are the places. Uh, we can see this is a, 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 a map that shows the autocorrelation, moral, moral autocorrelation, where you can see the effect that neighbors have in another neighbors uh, in terms of crime. It's interesting because it's, the, it's very common that neighbors with low crime rates are kind of zip low again, Pareto's distribution. And this slide shows how the distribution is made. In a graph divided into 2,500 census districts, we have 8% of these sectors concentrating more than 30% of violent crimes in the city. This map represents this concentration. Especially the downtown areas are the areas where we have more uh, and, and more. This will have great implications for the structuring of urban spaces. Also bearing implica implications in city planning. You know, our our uh, uh, manager of the city needs to know this distribution to make some arrangements in terms of the plan. Uh, and also to strengthen communities because communities concentrated a lot of violent crime, especially homicides in the city. What we can do in terms of uh, prevent this problem? It's not a problem of poverty and inequality and crime, because we have a lot of communities that are very poor but not violent. And uh, again, we have to understand the social disorganization that happens in some communities uh, with low collective e efficacy, the term that he uses, has well as disorder and human decay in these areas. These are the key aspects to plan the prevention problems in these areas. Uh, let me take another example for another area, that is traffic accident. This is interesting because in Brazil you usually think that the <coughs> people usually think that the victims are the drivers and the pedestrians are responsible for their victimization. You know? Usually when happens an accident, the driver is the main responsible or the pedestrian, they, they are careless to walk in the streets. And, and it's interesting because when we see the data, you know, first of all, we have a clear pattern of distribution of crime in the time. You know? We have here uh, uh, some Periods of the year where happens more uh, accidents, and we have accidents that happens more often. You know? This is, for example, this one. this cloud of words shows what are the the, the, the most most common accidents and the vehicles involved. You know? Well, 
Uh, <coughs> let me take a look about the spatial model distribution of the accidents. The question is, why people become bad drivers and adopt careless behaviors in the same places and the same times? What's happening is, is, is a kind of dementia that happens in people in special times and special uh, uh, places. Maybe that's only it's because not only people but places are sometimes the cause of accidents. Solution can be taken, for example, take some engineer and, and another kind of strategy to correct the problems that we have uh, in this in this place. Well, uh, the same also happens in crime. There are two dimensions to organize the analysis of crime in urban centers. The crime opportunity. Uh, structure to crime happens and the social disorganization. Usually when we think in urban environments we will have these two dimensions and what we have to understand is how these dimensions happen in the space and what are the va variables uh, that we have to understand the distribution of crime in space. <coughs> For example, this is the general model to understand the crime uh, in Rio de Janeiro. We, when we have an overall look at the determinant of violent crimes, we obtain some variables like population density that are related to opportunity and have to do with availability of targets and to the necessary anonymity in order to commit a crime. This is a kind of rational explanation of, of, of the crime. But uh, uh, we have to understand the, why they, they are happening in, 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 in closed space. You know? The first law of geography formulated by Waldo Tobler 40 years ago said that everything is related to everything else. But near things are more related than distant things. This is the idea. One way to understand, the best way to understand near things is the kernel map or by attempting to regionalize the space. This, for example, distribution of crime and in my city will have different points, dots, where they are happening. We can put this in a grid, then we can weight this by a kernel function in, in a way that close events are more important than distant things, and the result will be this. Or the, uh, <coughs> the best number of occurrences of violent crime become focused in some places in the city. You know? Another way to understand the regionalization, for example, is trying to make some distribution of events in some parts of the city. This, for example, is my state, uh, is Minas Gerais, where we can transform this in a graph. You know? And this graph, uh, we, we use a specific graph, is the minimal edge tree, where when you put a line of this graph, we divide it the map in two ways, and then we we will divide the graph in two, and the computer will then continue to section of the graph, graph various times, analyzing the variance of rates, grouping them into clusters. This is the idea. This is the result, for example, of Rio de Janeiro. Rio de Janeiro, we can see in different territories, but we are using uh, specific intent to understand how the crime is distributed in Rio de Janeiro. Only 10, 10 areas. No? It's interesting because the variables that are responsible to explain the crime and violence in each one of these areas are very different. No? When we see, for example, the downtown, uh, we can see the downtown. Uh, we have some variables like population density, the number of teenagers in the streets, and, and specific time variables that explain the concentration of crime in the downtown <coughs> area. No? It's especially uh, a case for the opportunity explanation for the, the crime. 
When you look in another region of the city, of these areas that you will recognize, we have another explanation related to the social deurbanization. Personal crime in North region is explained by variables like uh, <coughs> single head family, teenagers, social development index, and rented houses. All are variables that is explained by the social deorganization component of the, uh, uh, of the crime in the city. This, for example, is, uh, is a way to evaluate and use it by the RISE, is a group in Medellin, that they take some uh, satellite photos and try to understand the, through the images, uh, they design an econometric model in which variables such as covered land, green space, roads, construction, density, and urban settings are used in order to verify if there is a relationship to the types of disorder and the crimes in these places. Or disorder, trying to understand the urban disorder and the concentration especially of homicides. And this means try to understand, divide the city in different areas and try to define and try to find what are the significant uh, uh, results that we get. No? This means that we have to understand the specific groups that are affected in each area by the crime problem and try to develop some ways to, de to evaluate the results. Now, this is a kind of evaluation that we did in, in the World Bank did in, in Belo Horizonte about the fica vivo problem. They designed a control group, you know, then they, they, they make the, a pair of some uh, similar, similar groups and then they will analyze the effect of this kind of structures to prevent crime try to understand the decline you can see that's a really effective thing. And this is uh, another, is a, a, a cost-benefit analysis. No? The, the, the problem of Faraday was to demonstrate the cost-benefit that they are, they is inventing an uh, interesting thing, trying to uh, demonstrate to the politician that is really a cost-effective uh, way to do politics. Well, this in general is, is uh, what we can talk about the urban environment, uh, trying to uh, join together the different strategies to deal to manage all of them related to social disorganization and crime opportunities. Thank you. Well, uh, every time I, I'm a, I'm a social scientist. Every time I meet my fellow uh, natural science to talk about uh, uh, challenges to sustainability, uh, I get the feeling that uh, our social science is a little bit in a, in a disadvantage because our dream as a social science it's actually to ensure that everybody <coughs> uh, on Earth get access to all political, civil, but mainly economic and social rights. And as uh, he mentioned to us and he presented uh, so uh, clearly, uh, most people on Earth uh, uh, are not getting the right uh, economic and social rights. So the main focus of uh, social science is actually to fight some kind of uh, poverty, some kind of inequality. Uh, at the end, uh, but when we talk about uh, reducing inequality, we're not saying that uh, we should uh, uh, take rights from the people that have so they become equal to the people that have not. Actually, we are talking about giving rights to people that have not. So they become equal to people that have the rights. Well, if you, we measure uh, uh, how much, uh, what's the gap in rights in the world? The gap in uh, social and economic rights, not to say in other human rights, uh, it's immense, as was presented here uh, uh, before. Uh, 
So the question is, uh, the route to ensure that everybody in the world has their proper human rights necessarily will require a lot of resources. In particular, will require a lot of uh, natural resources. So actually, we come to this dialogue as demanding uh, 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 an extra piece of earth. Um, and uh, uh, so this is uh, why uh, social science is always uh, making certain disadvantage on, on this uh, topic. So what uh, social science can do? Since we have to give this uh, 7 billion people on Earth uh, a huge amount of uh, rights that uh, 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 we as social scientists, we keep increasing the number of rights uh, almost uh, every month or every year. And uh, we now have the right to development, that everybody has the right to development, which is kind of uh, quite open-ended uh, uh, rights. Uh, uh, so to ensure all this, to ensure everything to everybody uh, would be expensive. Um, so what the social science can do uh, to help sustainability, I think what the social science can do uh, and that's connect a little bit with uh, Beato was presenting here. It's actually make sure that we provide these rights in a very efficient way. So what social science can do is to design policies where people don't kill each other and make this whole thing very expensive, but actually we have an harmonic society that can actually provide those services in a very, uh, uh, they can provide and ensure all these rights in a very uh, efficient, in a very uh, uh, cost-effective way. Okay? To provide uh, all this, to ensure all these rights in a cost-effective way, uh, we need a lot of uh, 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 empirical evidence to design those policies. To spend resources uh, trying to ensure rights without uh, empirical evidence, you are going to waste a lot of resources. And that's precisely how, uh, since we are not willing to sacrifice rights, we are not willing to exclude anybody from this uh, 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 right, uh, the least we can do is to make sure that we provide this in a very efficient and effective way. What I, I prepared here is uh, kind of uh, eight domains where uh, evidence is important for uh, policy design. Just to illustrate how, uh, how important is uh, evidence for policy design. Actually, uh, uh, Claudio present here a considerable amount of uh, a very nice example how uh, evidence is very important uh, uh, to uh, uh, make um, uh, 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 peace something more uh, uh, viable and less expensive because there's a lot of, uh, 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 if you know all the graphs and maps that he present here, actually you can take actions in a much more efficient and uh, you can uh, reduce uh, 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 violence in a very effective way. So I I'm going to go uh, uh, quickly and present uh, some evidence uh, I'm going to present these eight domains and present some evidence in each one. Okay, well the eight uh, domains are like this. I mean, it's very important that we recognize where we are ha having progress. Okay. Um, it's very important that we because recognizing where we are having uh, progress. Say, well, at least on this area, we uh, we are uh, uh, advancing. We don't have to do uh, extra policies in this area. We have to identify why we are having progress, so we understand uh, the causal relationship behind this uh, progress, so we can actually uh, uh, make this progress to continue. 
Third, we, we have to identify where we have failures. Um, fourth, we have to detect new trends. It's very important to detect that new social changes are coming so we can design policies to deal with these new trends. Uh, you have to rely on ex-ante evaluations, so uh, evaluations that uh, uh, in social science, in social policy, in public policy, many times we just implement policy without any ex-ante evaluation on what would be the uh, likely uh, 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 impact of that uh, 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 policy. So it's very important to introduce uh, social science to help uh, governments with uh, ex-ante evaluation so we can estimate before we implement programs what would be the uh, 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 likely impact of that uh, action. Uh, six, uh, once we have implemented, we have to do some exposed impact evaluation to know if exact that thing actually happened. Uh, seven, we have to learn from others in the sense that uh, an evaluation and a program done in India could help us to design our social policy. So it's very important that the knowledge and the impact evaluation of different programs, every time you do an impact evaluation, that thing is important for uh, uh, your program, but it's important for uh, all over the world. Uh, anybody that's actually doing, uh, designing a similar program will need that uh, uh, information. Um, and finally, it's important to identify programs uh, with no impact. So I'll, uh, I'll spend uh, five, uh, ten minutes here just to illustrate how this was important uh, for Brazil, let's say, over the past ten years. How this evidence was used by Brazilian government to uh, implement uh, policy. So just to recognize success. Uh, probably this is the biggest success of Brazil over the past uh, uh, 10 years. This is a map of the Human Development Index of Brazil. In 2000, um, and actually uh, in 19, uh, 1990, 85% of municipalities in Brazil had a, a Human Development Index below 0.5 with a very low development level, okay? So, in 1990, it was 85%. Here in 2000, it's about uh, uh, 45%, okay? 10 years later, that's the map for Brazil. So we changed from this to this, and actually we changed from almost half of the municipality being of very low levels of development to less than 1%. So in one decade, if you want to see the, uh, uh, this is the pattern, you can see that Brazil is a bimodal, because we get the northeast in one, and the southeast and south in the other uh, mode. So it's a bimodal distribution. And that was the distribution in 2000, and in 2010 is this distribution. You can superimpose the two, and you can see the amazing progress, and if you trace a line around 0.5, you can see that in 10 years, we moved from almost half of the municipalities being very low levels of development to something less than 1%. So it's a, it's a great uh, success. The question is how you actually did that. So let me change uh, to, uh, so over this period, uh, Brazil get this reduction in inequality that you can see that Brazil starts in an inequality very large and it's declining. Uh, 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 you can see the gap in inequality between Brazil and China going down and the inequality is going down in Brazil for uh, 10 years in a row. Okay, So inequality was going down and uh, we get better living conditions for everyone. Uh, what was the determinant of this uh, progress? Uh, let me show you that uh, uh, eliminate, it's very important uh, to understand the determinants because many people say, well, we did that because we just became benevolent and you transfer income to the poor people, okay? 
uh, and the question is uh, absolutely uh, uh, that's absolutely not <laughs> the reason why Brazil did that change. That change is much more real than a simple income transfer would uh, 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 would be. Well, this is the increase in the income of the bottom 50 million Brazilians. Okay, the bottom 25 in Brazil is 50 million people. They increased their income over this period by 83 percent. The question is, how much was that? was coming from just benevolent transfers and how much was coming from labor income and how much was just a demographic bonus because uh, uh, our fertility rates declined. And you can decompose that and you can see that uh, labor income was 52% of this decline. So uh, most of the improvement in social indicators in Brazil were actually related to productive inclusion of the poor. Okay, More than half of this uh, uh, group. Uh, in a minute I'm going to show you that uh, that's not true for the bottom 5%. So we, we do have a problem in the lower tail of the distribution. Um, well, this may be an important uh, graph because uh, it just, uh, many people say that, uh, some people may claim that uh, in Brazil, uh, we have this important uh, social progress, but this social progress actually came from abroad. Was because the Chinese and the world were demanding a lot of Brazilian products. The value of Brazilian products increased, Brazil became rich, and actually government did what the government did was not very important, actually. We get the gift from the world. We, we import uh, uh, wealth and growth from uh, our uh, patents, like uh, China and other countries that uh, demand uh, um, uh, uh, natural resources and, and, uh, and uh, agricultural products. But this graph, it's interesting because this is the growth rate of the poor 10%. And this is the growth rate of the poor 10% in one state, and that's the growth rate of the poor 10% in a neighboring state. Uh, so you can see that uh, if uh, the... So this is the results for two neighboring states, okay? Uh, if you are from Brazil, this is uh, Piauí and this is Maranhão, okay? Uh, these are two neighboring states. Uh, and the the point here is just show you that the uh, progress in two neighboring states were completely different, <coughs> and that would be would hard, hardly be the case if the actual progress came from abroad. If we're just internalizing a, 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 a gift from the rest of the world, probably uh, this would not be. Uh, 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 this state here, it's a natural resource, uh, re natural, rich natural re resource uh, state, and this is a very poor uh, 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 state in terms of natural resource, and actually it did better because actually it had better social policy. So this is graph is just to tell you that social policy uh, uh, matters and the implementation of social policy matters. Uh, but it's very important to recognize failure, and uh, let me just show you that uh, in Brazil, the children, this is age and this is poverty. And the amazing thing about Brazil is that the children in Brazil, it's uh, twice as poor as the average. And the elderly in Brazil, it's uh, 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 one a tenth of the poverty rate of the average for Brazil. So actually we have a uh, age profile of poverty, that you were born poor, and when you, when you are an elderly person, then you become absolutely non-poor. And that has to do with how we actually have our uh, 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 social transfer uh, system, and I'll come back later. So that's, that's one uh, problem, and based on this, the Brazilian government actually did a program exactly 
to eliminate this uh, section here. So he actually did construct an entire program just based on this graph to eliminate uh, 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 this uh, piece here. Okay? Uh, create a special uh, uh, transfer program exactly to eliminate this. Uh, oh, that's teenager pregnancy that uh, it's very high and stable over time. Um, uh, examples, Brazil get, have a, 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 a breastfeeding uh, uh, programs to uh, try to improve breastfeeding programs. Uh, this is the level of breastfeeding in uh, the exclusive breastfeeding in 1996. This is 2006. This is going up. You can say, well, that's a success. The problem with this graph is that uh, what you have here is the degree of vulnerability. And you can see that here is the low vulnerability families, and here is the high vulnerability families. Of course, in the high, highly vulnerable families, the breastfeeding is smaller. But the worst thing is that uh, the success of our policy show up in the uh, least vulnerable women. So actually, the program that was designed to improve breastfeeding among poor families actually reach well-educated and better-off families because they could actually understand better the program and they actually could implement the program because they don't have to leave the children uh, behind and, and get to work without any uh, social benefit. So actually, uh, you have a program, but you don't have the impact that you want because the program could not reach the actual poor. Actually, the program increased inequality in breastfeeding. Okay, between the children of the rich and children of the poor. So that's evidence that you have to use to redesign the program. Um, well, that's a, an important graph because uh, remember I mentioned to you that inequality went down in Brazil. But inequality in Brazil is still huge because this is um, a graph of uh, the human development index around the world. Uh, and this green line is the human development around, uh, if you move around the municipality in Brazil. And what this graph tells you is that uh, if you go from, from the uh, municipality in Brazil with the lowest human development indicator, which is, uh, uh, let's say, Jordão in Acre or Fernando Falcão in, in Maranhão, you, are, you get the human development like Uganda. And as you move around Brazil, you go to uh, uh, Santos or São Caetano in São Paulo, and you get closer to the Netherlands. So actually, uh, if you walk around Brazil, you can see 85% of the uh, uh, world development indicators in the world. So if you want to know what, how human development can vary, uh, just Around Brazil, you can get the 85% of the variation of the world. Just telling you that uh, even though we reduce inequality with those graphs, uh, uh, of course our remaining inequality is huge. Um, well, one big problem for Brazil that uh, uh, Brazil is trying to solve right now, just to give you how empirical evidence can feed policy. This is the growth rate of uh, earnings in Brazil. So this being 130 means that uh, in eight years, we increase labor earnings, real labor earnings by 30%, which is very good. And everything, everybody should celebrate this, and that's related to how we reduce poverty and so on. We increase labor earnings of people that are working. And our unemployment rate is very low, so everybody's celebrating it. The problem is, when you look at the labor productivity, and the labor productivity increased by less than 15%, then you get concerned, because you say, well, workers are getting 30% more, but they are producing just 15% more. Okay, uh, in the short run, I can, this means some redistribution of income from capital to labor. But we can do a little bit of that for a while, but not forever. Um, 
is a famous economist that say that uh, okay, labor productivity is not everything, but in the long run, it's almost everything. Because if you don't increase your labor productivity, you don't increase how much a worker produces, it's very hard to, uh, to to believe that they are going to keep increasing their consumption pattern if they're not producing more. Okay, so Brazil has this uh, uh, has opened this amazing edge, making labor income to increase more than labor productivity, that's good because probably correct some imbalances that we accumulate over uh, uh, decades, but that's not good forever. And we are in trouble because this graph gives you the labor productivity 30 years ago and the labor productivity, let's say, today. And uh, this 45 line means that uh, the Brazil labor productivity 30 years ago and the Brazilian average labor productivity today is about the same. So we are, uh, we have stagnated in terms of our labor productivity over a 30 year period. So uh, that's complicated because we want labor productivity to go up for wages to go up. But the amazing thing is about Korea that Korea is on the same vertical line means that uh, in, ni in 1980, Korea and Brazil get the same productivity. <laughs> and now, Korea, 30 years later, get a productivity that's three times the Brazilian labor productivity. So actually, uh, in 30 years, Korea that used to have the same labor productivity of Brazil is now having a labor productivity that's three times higher. You can say, well, Korea... Um, they are crazy. They want uh, they worship uh, productivity. So let them be whatever they want to be, and we don't care. But uh, then it comes China. China uh, thirty years ago, China had a productivity that was equal to one tenth of the Brazilian productivity, and now China is approaching the labor productivity of Brazil. And once China surpass Brazil in terms of labor productivity would be very hard to put Brazilian products in the world uh, and competing with China. So we can say that uh, Korea, we don't care, but uh, probably we should care uh, about uh, uh, at least matching the uh, uh, increase in labor productivity of, uh, of uh, China. Uh, okay, uh, look to the importance of detection of uh, new trends. Uh, just going to give you one example. This is the graph of the, pop, the uh, working age population, let's say between 15 and 59 years old. Uh, at least uh, in the old times, that's how we define the working age population. Um, now we increase probably this to 25 and this to 69 or something like that. But that's the working age population by one definition. This is a bunch of uh, dependent people, people less than 15 and at least six years old. And you can see that Brazil up to 1970, Brazil get uh, this going up at the same rate. So you get, uh, let's say, one active person, one dependent person, you get one to one. Look what happens since then. So. The working age population increased a lot, and the dependent population increased very little. And today we get 65 million people, extra million people, able to work compared to people that are dependent. This is a window of opportunity that you have to use it well. The problem is. You get this window of opportunity in a moment that labor productivity is not increasing at all. So uh, it complicates things. Okay, and just to tell you that uh, uh, we are analyzing policies to increase labor productivity, and the last time we count, we were already close to 900. So the Brazilian federal Brazilian federal government has at least 900, we're still counting, so we haven't finished it, but we have already something like 900 different actions the Brazilian federal government is making to increase 
labor productivity and labor productivity is very flat. So it's not a question of uh, not trying to make labor productivity to grow. It's actually the difficult in making each and every of those policies effective. Okay. Uh, so uh, let me just mention one data that uh, is very problematic for Brazil, and then I'm, I'm going to finish. Uh, this is the number of years that you, you, your population, 6, 5 uh, or more, increased from 7% to 14%. Okay? That's the aging of the population. Okay? So how long it takes for your population uh, above 65 years move from 7% of your entire population to 14? In France, this took 120 years. In Brazil, it's going to take less than 20 years. So that's to say that Brazil is aging six times faster than France. And in Brazil, the ratio of the transfers we do to elderly, to children, uh, the transfer for each elderly in Brazil is 10 times greater than the transfers we give to children. And so we have been very benevolent to the elderly. And that makes sense in a country that got rich very fast and has a very small, tiny population with old people, they say, well, let's uh, take care of this small fraction of old people. But since you are going to be aging extremely quickly, if you don't change, if you do not adapt your social policy, you'll be in trouble. Because you are transferring 10 times more to the elderly than you are transferring to the children. So if you don't adjust your social policy, you're going to be stuck with a massive transfer of uh, income from one generation to the other generation. So just to tell you that uh, in a country where you have a very quick uh, social and demographic change, social policy has to adapt also very quickly. What we used to say in, in social policy is that uh, a good social policy it, it's, uh, uh, it, it kills itself. Because if you have a very good social policy that solves a problem, that social policy becomes irrelevant uh, uh, very quickly. So one of the major problems for Brazil today, and that's why the empirical evidence and social science is so important, is that uh, we have been so successful in eliminating so many different problems that we have to move on with our social policy. Problems that we had, like hunger, that we have before, now are very located, very small, so it requires a completely different policy, a completely different uh, amount of resources. While, meanwhile, all the problems are uh, emerging and we have to move resources. So the point is a country with a fast demographic and a fast social change need to have a social policy that moves very quickly, and that's a major challenge for Brazil today. And to make the social policy to move very quickly, we need a lot of uh, uh, evidence to design these po po uh, policies in an effective way, and so not to be a huge burden to the uh, sustainability of the development. Thank you.